good to see y'all this morning. I'm Blake Lightman. I serve as IPM coordinator in Mississippi, among other things. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is to give you like the big drone's eye view of our Mississippi EIP program, which is funded by NIFA, or at least partially funded by NIFA. And one point I think it's worth making is that's really in the big scheme of things not a whole lot of money, but because we already have active, established IPM programs in all of these areas I'm going to talk to you about, those fundings are huge in leverage. So a lot of these activities that I'm going to show you about are really enhanced by this this relatively small amount of funding. Uh, so this is a you know a broad perspective IPM program covers insects, diseases, nematodes, weeds, and this is our team. So we've got we have a few more specialists that work in IPM, but we have ten that are on this grant. We have an agronomist, Dr. Darren Dodds. We have a horticulturist, Dr. Jeff Newton. Four plant pathologists, Dr. Tom Allen in our Delta, Clarissa Barbarian runs our plant disease lab, Rebecca Malansar is another plant pathologist as an area specialist, and then Dr. Allen Hughes is a state level specialist. He works with row crops and specialty crops. And then we've got four entomologists, Dr. Angus Ketchup and Dr. Jeff Gore are our row crop entomology specialists. Dr. Jerome Goddard focuses only on public health, things that bite or suck blood, and then any other area, usually that falls to me, so that's kind of the way that works out. So our four, our five priority areas that we cover under this program are agronomic crops, specialty crops, IPM and communities, pest diagnostic, and also IPM and public health without the guard. Now, I want to divert just a minute because in the past we've had some discussion about the difficulty getting reviewers that understand what extension is, and we understand the reasons for that, and this has done a great job of helping us solve this problem or, or working with it, but uh, and we've also had difficulty getting reviewers that understand the difference between a program and a project, and so I want to just diverge a minute, and this is things we all know, I understand that, but if you think we, these are all comprehensive IPM programs, and they're kind of divided into three activities that we do as specialists, things we do to acquire information. Once we get that information, we've got to sort and shuffle it ourselves to put it into a, a program and other products that then we can deliver in all these various ways. And I won't enumerate those here. Y'all are familiar with all of those. I do want to just point out, though, one of my things I like to point out is you say, you know, literature review and meetings, that's like what we're doing here where we get information from each other. But to me, this is a big one. And everybody in here that works with growers, you understand there's site visits and client consultations, you might think, a lot of people, well, that's delivering information. Well, no, I get as much information back from those guys. Oh, this is what they need, or this is why they're doing that, or this is why they're not doing that. And all of our other specialists are in that same boat, too. So as far as learning from our growers and our clients. Now, another thing we need to point out, and this gets to that that I just mentioned, is that a comprehensive IPM program is composed of many different little smaller projects. And I'm not going to elaborate on all of these, but you could have a project just to evaluate efficacy of insecticides for a particular pest. I believe it is here now. So, you know, I saw the poster out there where the Mid South group joined together to evaluate efficacy on plant bugs. And y'all had a lot of plant bugs in some of those trials, anyway. <laughs> so, or you could have a demonstration. In this case, I was doing this for myself to demonstrate what a Swirsky box could be used on a bike class, class system in poinsettias things of that nature. You could have a survey of, you know, do we have agents of hip in Mississippi anymore? That was a question Dr. Goddard was trying to answer. If so, where are they? How prevalent are they? And all those other types of things. I don't want to spend a lot of, money, a lot of time talking about those. Another thing, though, is that these comprehensive IPM programs can exist at different levels. So when we first start out, it might just be Harness plant bugs in cotton, so a single pest, single discipline, single crop. But of course, the next level up is we got to look at all the bugs in the cotton field or a multi pest complex for a single discipline in a single crop. Then the next step up is well, we got to figure out what's important for our plant past peers and our weed science peers. And so now we got to look at all the bugs, all the diseases, and all the weeds in the cotton field. I just happened to I figured many of this in this group could relate to cotton. I worked in cotton in another uh, career. 
And so we, we can deal with that. I mean, some of us remember what it was like. Well, if you would just use this insecticide to control the roots on your cotton, then that would allow us to overspray it with this herbicide and it wouldn't kill the cotton. So, you know, we, we end up with issues like that. And then we also have to fold, fold that multi pest complex system into the agronomy and the economics of that crop. And then we finally get down to where we're at the community landscape level. If you're talking about a row crop, well, that might just be, hey, what crops are being grown next to us? And just what are you going to be spread on your soybeans? And, you know, how much is that going to drift over on my crop? Or if you're not talking about something else, well, you might be talking about, are you really going to use these neonicotinoids on these plants and then come plant them in my yard? You know, that type of thing. So you've got all those issues that you have to deal with. So now I'm going to get back on track. And I'm going to tell you just a little about some of the activities that occur in each of these uh, priority areas. So we'll start with the one on agronomic crops. And of course, there we focus on the pests of our major growth crops. And the, the team that focuses on that, there's five of our members of Dr. Angus Ketchout, and Jeff Gore is an entomologist, Dr. Darren Dodge, as I said, the agronomist, weed science. And then we've got Dr. Alan Hinn and Dr. Tom Allen that are our plant pathologists. I'm showing five of the crops that these guys work with that there are more there. As far as some of the activities that they're involved in, of course, they spend a lot of time doing efficacy trials and surveys and scouting, dozens and dozens of efficacy trials. And that's primarily to inform and keep up to date this particular publication, this set of recommendations. And you can see there are nine different crops that are included in that. And then once they get that publication, they develop their IPM programs, they've updated them from the year that's done in the wintertime, then they deliver that information to a variety of ways. They have a crops bar that's done every week, even through the winter months, I think. I don't think it, I don't think it dies in the winter months like some of my projects do. They have a lot of, used to be cotton insect scouting schools, but they've expanded this to other insect scouting on other crops. And of course, a whole bunch of grower meetings culminating in a large row crops short course that you have done, I think, in December, I think it was done this year. And as far as the impacts, now you could get more fine-tuned on this, but I just want to give the gross level today. And I, of course, in any one of these crops, you know, we can claim that, hey, we're helping growers make higher yields for lower costs. You know, there's, there's not a crop involved there that that doesn't occur. So now let's talk about our specialty crops program. And now we're focusing, of course, on insect pests and specialty crops. That includes both edible crops and ornamental crops. So I'm showing there we've got greenhouse ornamentals, nursery crops, greenhouse vegetables, field grown vegetables. And we'll just let the time stand for our whole host of uh, other specialty crops, fruits and nuts. And that's you know, the people involved in that are Dr. Dr. Malasa, Dr. Jeff Dean is our horticulture specialist, and then myself. And that's only five of those. It's a lot broader than that. So I tried to list most of the specialty crops that I could think of in Mississippi, and I know them don't smoke. I know there are states that could list a whole lot where you'd have to use a really tiny print if you would list all the specialty crops in Florida. I understand that, but. If you're the only specialist that has to cover those, it's kind of challenging. And so the point is, you can't really go in great detail in any one of those. So we don't do as much proactive work as we would like to in any one of those because that would cause us to be neglecting the others. So a lot of our work in this area in particular is reactive, unfortunately. So these are some of the activities that we're involved in. You'll notice a trend here. Of course, you knew that trend existed anyway. This particular audience does. Uh, efficacy trials. Were, we're doing one on, I think, spider mites and greenhouse tomatoes. Demonstrations on poinsettias of a biocontrol project. This is Dr. Jeff Denny. One point I want to make is for our horticulture peers, I think they do us a great service just when they do these trials because by the time a plant is selected as an All-American selection winner, or Mississippi medallion winner. Well, that means it's a pretty plant and it grows well, but that tells us, well, the insects and diseases aren't as big a problem on that plant because if they were, it wouldn't make that rating. So that's useful to me. 
And then, of course, we're all involved in doing the diagnostics, maybe not in a lab setting. Carissa is, and some of us are, but this diagnostics for the grower. I really didn't have a picture showing an interaction with a grower like I really wanted to use, troubleshooting and consultation, but this is the end result of that. This was an organic strawberry grower that was trying to figure out how to control spider mice. And so here we are. Here he is releasing about seed mice in the strawberry field. And then, of course, we do educational programs and publications, a lot, a lot of those as well. And in the end result there, of course, the impact is, again, it's higher yields and lower costs. And you can pick any one of those commodities. I won't diverge on that right now, but it'll take a lot of specific study to get real dollars to go with that. That's kind of a pet concern of mine, okay? But it also results in better quality of either fruit or ornamental, ornamental fruit. Now I'll move to talking about our community IPM program, and of course that's when you have to give me five years, have you? Okay, I'll be through pretty soon. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll be on time. That's good. <laughs> so this is our community IPM program, pets protecting both homes and landscapes, and that can be single-family dwellings or multi-family apartment complexes insect pests in home lawns, in home landscapes, and in home vegetable gardens. So that's a, that's a really fun area to work in in some ways because it, from my perspective, I like it because it impacts all our Mississippi citizens. Every taxpayer in Mississippi benefits from this particular IPM program. And even if, even if they're not taxpayers or not taxpayers yet, they still benefit. So and it also includes our most economically damaging insects, which I would add. I would say our fire ants and termites. Now, another set, Dr. Goddard's mosquitoes on the side for obvious reasons. He could play a trump card if he wants to any time on that. And I fully agree. And I just had to show this information because, I mean, you talk about a mixed metaphor, okay? So we've got a 2006 study where they're showing 2,000 data on fire ant impact in Mississippi. That's just for Mississippi. And the interesting thing, Back in my cotton days, I thought this was, I thought cotton was it. You know, that's what we spent most of our time and effort on. But I found it interesting that the cost plus loss to fire ants exceeded that of the 2014 data for soybeans and cotton together. And I think I even looked at the corn data and sold that in there. I have no idea. I don't have any basis for termites, but I'm sure they're more economically important than fire ants in this so as far as some of the activities, again, here, we do efficacy trials, not that many. This is an efficacy trial on a termiticide, but we're not testing the termiticide. We're testing the method of application. It was a big EUP study, and it resulted in changing the label so that we could apply this termiticide in a more cost-effective way, and it still works just as well. Surveys, a lot of different surveys. That's just counties that we have in Mississippi now that are infested with the uh, criminal bark scale. Of course, phone calls, I mean, that's a big deal in extension work. You get a lot of those. I haven't mentioned it in any of other areas, but thousands of those every year, as well as email responses now. We maintain a lot of websites, generate some newsletters that go out weekly during the growing season. I think Lisa mentioned Master Gardener Training, where we do that too. And of course, a lot of it is by distance education, so this is just this is one county that only has six people, but they were watching it with the state group. I think we have about 30 counties calling in that year. And in various educational programs and extension publications. May need a little sip of water. So I don't usually have this happen, but thank you. I appreciate it. That may be what it is. Out here in communities, you know, I mentioned that was. Homes and apartments impact then is household savings. Savings in the household budget for these different taxpayers increase quality of life. Thank you.
people are just a whole lot happier when their values look pretty and it's made of space here. So, I mean, increased quality of life is a big deal. And then when they don't realize the increased pesticide safety, that's maybe less of an issue now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. I would still have a lot of guys using organophosphates and things of that nature. But it's still an issue. Our disease and insect diagnostics program, now the majority of that is Ms. Palbar. So she does our plant disease and nematode, and that's, that's a huge volume, and it takes a lot of effort to identify those for us. So, but I also do work on the insect identification as well. So this just shows some of the activities. She does a lot of disease diagnosis, runs a lot of nematode assays. I do some insect identifications. We charge for some of those. She charges for hers, but we don't charge for the insect ID because, you know, there's there's commodities that are consumed and it takes a lot more labor. And so they have a couple of student workers also doing that, so there's a lot more labor involved. <coughs> Whereas with insect ID, 90% of the insects that we get in, you can slide ID on them. The question is not so much what is it, but it's what do you do about it. You can't just tell them what it is. You've got to tell them what you do about it. So this is heavily involved in the IPM aspect of that. We have our various websites, but the bottom line here is they want a recommendation. That's the reason they sent that sample in or that. Well, it doesn't get a lot of emails with pictures, but I do, or text or things like that, because it's, again, it's easy to do with insects. And so we want to provide them with a good recommendation. You can't see this one. This was one turf where there were actually three different diseases involved. And this is a, like a two-page response where she talks more about, it's not how spray it with this and the problem is gone. It's all these cultural practices that they need to do to keep from having the problem with her. And, of course, the impact of that is if they've got better pest ID, they get better pest control, and they get reduced pest damage and for a lot less cost. So we have those kinds of impacts there. And then finally, we'll end up with our insects affected or arthropods affecting public health. Dr. Goddard is the only specialist involved there. He might say, well, he needs somebody to work with, so that MDH, that's the Mississippi Department of Health. We've got Dr. Goddard from the Mississippi Department of Health, so he has some strong ties there. And they work together on all these things that bite, suck blood, and transmit disease. As a real an aside, in about the last 10 to 15 years, we've had a resurgence of black flies in Mississippi. We went years, decades, didn't have black flies. I think it's because our water quality is improving now over time. And Dr. Goddard would agree. Of course, these are the things that make the headlines. You know, big headlines for obvious reasons. And probably all of us in here know people that have suffered from one of these diseases or more of these diseases mentioned up here. So the activities are similar. I don't know what he's got in that box, but he's doing an efficacy trial there. Uh, here's a survey being done of uh, some mosquitoes across the state. I think they were looking to determine there where do we have Aedes aegypti at what levels. Also, there's surveys for ticks. And again, a host of educational programs, a lot of involvement in public media. This is some of Dr. Goddard's information, and I wanted to point this out. This is what he's teaching a group, maybe of mosquito control uh, workers. The media can be your best friend, but the media can also be your worst enemy. So that, that came across in one of his educational programs. And of course, he generates a lot of publications too. So I'll just end right here by, you know, the impacts, of course, in this area, he can say, we can say it results in fewer illnesses and fewer deaths. And I think I better just leave it at that. I'm making probably out of time. I do have another part of this program I want to present. I've talked to David about this. It'll fit in better this afternoon anyway. And once I got going with it, I realized, hey, I'm not going to have time to do that this morning. Maybe my voice will be better this afternoon. Thank you. Yes, no.
that's, that's a good question. So, if I remember the number roughly, we get about $147,000 a year, and you saw we got 10 scientists involved. So, if there's still kind of family, some of those guys don't get a very big piece of that pot. It goes into like the row crop acumen program. So, depending on the program, that's how the funds are used. One of the key things for us is to fund out of state travel because we get into these budget countries in the state and they say, no out of state travel. And some of the guys, like the road crop guys, that get a lot of grants, well, they can go out of state. But some of those other guys that don't get a lot of other grants, we just kind of stuck and we can't come to a meeting like this and learn. So, you know, that's a minor thing. One of the things I do with some of my commodity money is every year I produce a poster. One was on fire ants, one was on termites. This year it's going to be on crepe roll bark scale. But then I mail out to all 82. 82 counties, and we got one extra uh, Cherokee reservation. So, well, we, you know, it, when we write the grant, we kind of partition them out. It's tough, though. Yeah, how do you know how to do that? And, and like I said, there's not enough to go around. But we give each, usually each person has some, and that's able to supplement what they're already doing. So it's, it's not like. You know, they're not doing something without that. It's just, well, now we're able to do that little bit of extra. Yeah. And we, we just visit among ourselves and petition it out. You know, that's the real. That's how it's done. But because if you think about just trying to fight it out, you well, divide it. Okay, we're going to divide this by 10. It doesn't quite work. Because as I said, some groups have more fun than others. But the uh, Dr. Goddard's program, the public health program, they have a lot of access to funding for research. We did not really have any access to funding for extension activities. So we try to keep this strongly focused on extension, you know, not creating any knowledge other than some support for insecticide efforts and trials for the low crop guys, but delivering knowledge of the fundamental extension work. Yeah. Thank you, all. Look like, like I'm outside. <laughs>